All right, hello. So today I'll be talking about higher order approximations and boundary layer theory, and this is in particular based on the work of Milton Van Dyke from a series of papers that he published in 1962 in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. So the work that's been done so far on boundary layer theory, Ludwig Prantl was the founder of this field. Uh, he identified that the inviscid Euler equations, which are valid for large Reynolds number flows, are invalid if you have a body submerged in the fluid. So for example, if you have a surface such as a flat plate, the Euler equations are unable to satisfy the no-slip boundary condition. So what Prantl did is he used a series of scaling arguments to develop what are known as the Prantl boundary layer equations, which are sort of a simplified version of the Navier-Stokes equations that are valid in the boundary layer. A few years later, a student of his, Blasius, was the first to solve Prantl's boundary layer equations using a similarity solution technique. Uh, and the figure on the right shows the profile that he used in his similarity solution. And then since then, many researchers have been looking to adapt and, and develop corrections for the Prantl boundary layer equations, which are only valid for a flat plate, in order to account for other effects. Prantl himself identified that there should be a flow due to the displacement of the fluid around the boundary layer. There should be a vertical flow that results, uh, and he referred to this as the flow due to displacement thickness, and he had some ideas about how to correct the boundary layer equations for this flow. Murphy developed uh, and investigated corrections for longitudinal curvature, so instead of solving for a flat plate, if you want to solve for a curved plate, uh, or for example, a body such as an airfoil, and then Sieben and Bond develop corrections for transverse curvature. So instead of looking at plane flow, if we wanted to solve for axisymmetric flow around, for example, a body of revolution, Sieben and Bond investigated those effects. Until now, though, these effects have remained isolated and uncoordinated and somewhat scattered throughout the fluid mechanics literature. So the goal of the present work is to develop a unified theory of these higher order effects and we're seeking to account for displacement speed, longitudinal curvature, and transverse curvature, as I mentioned on the previous slide, all with a unified language. Uh, and we can also account with the same language for external vorticity and external stagnation enthalpy gradient. So not only can we account for fluid motion effects, but we can also account for thermal effects using the same language. Some assumptions that we'll make in this work, we're only gonna be considering incompressible laminar flow uh, a paper that I'll be publishing later this year will cover the compressible extension of this work, uh, but nonetheless we're considering laminar flow in the boundary layer uh, with no turbulence and no separation of the boundary layer. Uh, in this work I'll also be specializing to the cases of plane flow and axisymmetric flow, which are valid for the majority of the cases that we're interested, such as airfoils, uh, plane flow over an airfoil, or axisymmetric flow, for example, around a missile or a rocket. For the formulation of the problem, we consider steady laminar flow of, of a viscous incompressible fluid for which the mass conservation takes the form of the continuity equation, the divergence of the velocity being zero. Uh, and here we've made the assumption that the fluid properties are constant throughout the domain. And then the linear momentum conservation takes the form of the Navier-Stokes equations. For the steady case, we can ignore the local acceleration term, but we still have the convective acceleration. And then we've also applied a dynamic scaling for the pressure, uh, basically stating that for high Reynolds number, the pressure is dominated by inertial effects rather than by viscous effects. If we're interested, we can also solve the energy equation subsequently for thermal effects. But uh, due to our incompressible fluid assumption, this is basically a, a subsequent step. In other words, the energy equation doesn't affect the solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, but subsequently we can solve for thermodynamic effects. The solution technique that we'll take for this problem is to form two separate solutions, one valid for the outer flow and one valid for the inner flow, and both will be composed of a, an asymptotic series. So for the outer flow, which is valid far from the surface, we refer to this as the Euler limit because as we'll see, the dominant effects are governed by Euler equations. Whereas for the flow close to the surface in the boundary layer, we'll refer to this as the Prantl limit because the dominant effects are governed by Prantl's boundary layer equations. Starting off with the outer expansion, the perturbation parameter is believed to be of the order one over the square root of the Reynolds number. So we can form our asymptotic expansion for all of our solution variables. 
So for example, if we're dealing with the velocity field and the pressure field, they would both have the following form. If we're solving for thermal effects, we could also form the same asymptotic expansion for the temperature field. Uh, the components of velocity, if you look at inside the velocity vector, they all have the same form. Uh, and alternatively, if we wanted to solve, instead of the velocity form of the Navier-Stokes equation, if we wanted to solve for the vorticity uh, or solve in terms of a stream function, they would also have the same asymptotic expansion. We can take this asymptotic solution and plug it into our governing equations, and then what we can do is equate orders, uh, equate terms of the same order. So to order one, we get the following. So the first equation is the continuity equation, and then the second equation is the Navier-Stokes equation to first order. And then uh, if we're interested in solving for thermal effects, we would also have the energy equation. And what we identify is that to first order, the outer flow satisfies Euler equations. If we look instead at uh, an order of magnitude smaller in the flow, uh, we no longer get the standard Euler equations. We can refer to this as somewhat of a modified Euler equations. Uh, so that the first two equations are the continuity and linear momentum, or Navier-Stokes equation, and then the third equation is the second approximation for the thermal, uh, for, for the energy equation. So what we'll notice here is that viscous effects don't appear in any of these terms, and so for the outer flow, uh, viscous effects are not present until we get to order three. So the boundary conditions that we can impose, we can impose the upstream in other words, the far field boundary condition, uh, the upstream flow. But at the surface of the body, the only condition that we can impose is the kinematic condition. We cannot impose the, we can't satisfy the no slip boundary condition. For the inner expansion, we'll follow a very similar procedure. Uh, in the meantime, we'll produce, introduce a boundary layer variable uh, following Prandtl. And what this allows us to do is magnify the normal coordinate so that the flow in the normal direction is of the same order of magnitude as the flow in the horizontal direction. Doing so, we obtain the following for our asymptotic expansions for the various solution variables. And you'll note that the normal component of velocity, the order one term, has uh, the square root of the Reynolds number present. That's the scaling argument. And then similarly as before, if we're interested in solving for thermal effects, or if instead we wanted to deal with a stream function rather than the components of velocity, we could have uh, similar asymptotic expansions. As before, we're going to substitute these asymptotic series into our governing equations and then equate terms with the same order of magnitude. So to order one, we get the following for the continuity and Navier-Stokes equations, and then this would be the representation of the energy equation to order one. And what we identify is that these are Prandtl's boundary layer equations. So the inner flow to first order satisfies Prandtl's boundary layer equations. However, if we look at higher order terms, so this would be the second approximation, uh, we get extra terms and extra effects showing up. So here you start to see the effects of longitudinal curvature and transverse curvature uh, and those other effects that we mentioned. Uh, and then this would be the higher order thermal effects in the energy equation. For the inner expansion, we can satisfy both the no-slip and the kinematic boundary condition at the surface, but we cannot satisfy outer, uh, outer flow boundary conditions, which brings up the need for matching. So the outer solution, as I mentioned, can only satisfy the upstream boundary conditions. Uh, it can't satisfy the no-slip boundary condition, whereas the inner solution, while it can satisfy the no-slip boundary condition, cannot satisfy the outer flow conditions. Physically, we know that these two solutions have to agree at intermediate locations. So what we develop is a matching principle in order to basically provide the extra boundary conditions that we need in order to solve both problems. The matching principle that we have takes the form as, as shown here. Uh, this is only valid for large Reynolds number flows. For uh, small Reynolds number flows, we have to deal with something a little bit more involved, but this is sufficient for the cases here. So to illustrate this matching condition, uh, I'll show a couple of examples. The first one being the case where m and p are both equal to 1. And so our outer expansion and inner expansion have the following forms. And so for m and p both equal to 1, we only want to consider the first order terms in both expansions. Walking through the matching conditions now, starting off with the left-hand side of the equation, the component in parentheses, the p term outer expansion, for p equal to 1, this is going to be the one-term outer expansion, which is just capital U1. 
Now we want the inner expansion of this one term outer expansion. And what that means is that we want to represent the outer expansion in terms of the inner variables. So we want to apply that magnified normal coordinate. And now we want to take the one term inner expansion of this one term outer expansion. And so physically what that means is that from the outer flow, we want to take a limit as we approach the surface of the body submerged in the fluid. In other words, we want to take n going to zero. We can do the same procedure on the inner expansion. So starting off with the one term inner expansion, the first term from the inner expansion. Now we can represent this in the outer solutions variables. So going from capital N to lowercase n. And then we want to take a limit as we exit the boundary layer n goes to infinity. So our matching principle tells us that the two of these have to be equal. So even without considering a higher order terms, here we've only dealt with m and p equal to 1. Uh, we've been able to account for an effect such as longitudinal curvature. If we consider instead some of the higher order terms, we can account for other effects as well. So for example, if we consider the case for m equal 1 and p equal 2, here instead of taking only the first term from both uh, expansions, we'll take both terms from the outer expansion, but only one term from the inner expansion. Carrying out the same procedure from the previous slide, uh, the matching condition that we obtain is the following. And so this has also a very nice physical interpretation. What this states is that the vertical component, the vertical solution for the outer flow at the surface looks like a series of sources distributed along the surface of the body. So this is essentially the flow due to displacement thickness. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the displacement uh, due to the boundary layer should produce a flow upwards out of the boundary layer into the outer flow. And this matching condition captures that effect. And so this is the first this instance where we start to see the boundary layer flow affecting the outer flow. Uh, and again, this is referred to as flow due to displacement thickness, and it's a higher order effect. So in conclusion, the unified theory that we presented today is able to, in a unified manner, describe primary effects such as longitudinal curvature, transverse curvature, external vorticity, and displacement speed. And while I didn't have time to discuss in the presentation, if you look in the manuscript, uh, if we look at second order approximations, we're also able to describe effects such as pressure gradients within the boundary layer, skin friction, and heat transfer from the surface that are all caused by things like longitudinal curvature, transverse curvature, and the other effects uh, mentioned earlier. Thank you for your time, and I'd also like to declare our funding sources, which include the Lockheed Missile and Space Company and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research.